this leads to the next question. Uh, in the table you showed us about the estimated cost per quality um, gained by yep. uh, treating HCV. Yes. There is something I couldn't understand well. Maybe this table is um, very general for just to show us. There are more details to be considered, I guess, in this. I'll try and find it. Sorry for flashing along. Yeah, I'm listening. Uh, well, I think there are more details to be Fix this. considered. Yeah. Yes. There are more details to be considered in this estimation. Um, I'm speaking from the medical point of view. Um, I couldn't understand well the recommendation in case of genotype 3, mm -hmm. um, in case of naive patients. Yep. Then there was recommendation to use the medication in case of cirrhosis. Yeah. Um, from my little background on, on this kind of medication, I think it's not indicated for R patients who have cirrhosis. Yeah. That or particular types of Yeah, with, all right, but with the, with the new generation of directly acting antivirals, which Sofosfavir is one of, mm -hmm. um, there is evidence of benefit in that group. And because they're further along, um, the, the bad things that are about to happen are much nearer in time. Yes. And so that's what makes it slightly more attractive to treat them. That was the view that was taken. Now another view is actually um, a far better group to treat um, vigorously and um, detect them and treat them are the um, intravenous drug users who are at a much earlier stage. Mm -hmm. They may still be asymptomatic or they may have mild evidence of mild disease and they are a much better bet because if you treat them successfully you're going to reduce onward transmission and um, I don't want to give publicity for my own work but <laughs> I did I was one of the authors on a paper uh, came out last year um, looking at this and arguing this um, that there is a prevention benefit it's not just a benefit to the health of the the patient who's being treated, there's a prevention benefit. And if you take that prevention benefit into account, actually it's not these patients who are quite far down the pathway that it's most cost effective to treat. It's, it's this earlier group. Um, this calculation, interestingly, I'm glad you asked it, asked the question, this calculation and the appraisal done of the other um, related, you know, Lidisprevir, Simetprevir, the whole series of these dr drugs, um, they looked only at the benefit to the patient and they didn't consider the benefit in terms of by treatment, successful treatment, uh, to what extent do you reduce transmission? and avoid other cases. So I think um, I think I would agree with you that um, once you recognize that, you would get more benefit from the um, no cirrhosis of people at an earlier stage. Uh, so I agree with you. In the, in the, where I disagree is the actual treatment is still of benefit. You know, it's, it's not sort of red, red. There was evidence of benefit for this group. And I think that's a, just a product of these um, new treatments. But of course, they don't do anything for your cirrhosis. You are still, you just no longer HCV positive. You are still cirrhotic. Right, four, five, and six at that stage, so this was decision making in about 2013, early 2014. Uh, at that stage, there was not a great deal of evidence in four, five, and six, partly because in the country where we at that stage were getting most of the evidence from, the United States, four, five, and six were much less common. Um, 
than in other parts of the world. Uh, it's now the case that we've got increasing evidence that also in four, five, and six, uh, particularly some of the combination therapies, so not just sofosfavir by itself, but some of the new other therapies, even newer therapies, do work in four, five, and six as well. Uh, but to my understanding, sofosfavir cannot be used by it, its own. It, it has to be combined with. Um, it, its, it, its initial license was um, in combination with pegylated interferon and ribavirin, or, <coughs> excuse me, uh, simply with ribavirin, yeah. Um, subsequently, we've now got um, sofosfavir with ledisprevir uh, and some other ones, and they are working also in genotype four, five, and six. Uh, I should stress, this was a, an estimation done for decision making in England, so it's not a, you know, so as I said in the previous slide, the, the pattern of genotypes is different across countries and so what might, and also at that point in time, given medical knowledge, it was made. So that's how it was, that's why it seemed the right decision at that point in England. It's not an assertion that we should never use sofosfavir in G, GT456, but simply in England at the time, given the evidence, it did not appear to be a good use of resources. Is it animal evaluation? <clears throat> um, no. What happens is when a recommendation is made, as part of the guidance right at the end, it says when the decision should be reviewed. Now sometimes there will be a very early review date, possibly because you're expecting some big trial to report or something like that. Other times it might be quite routinely say about a three year review date. Um, so uh, that varies. I can't remember the specifics for this one. Okay, not at all. Yes. Mm. But, uh, in Japan, uh, from last year, they introduced the cost effectiveness assessment for the new drugs approval, and uh, that um, uh, you know that uh, there is a fixed proportion of the insurance that uh, from the government and from the individual. Mm. I just wonder that if some new drug is very sensitive to a very small population. That, uh, but the government, uh, when they assess the cost effectiveness, they may think about uh, this drug is not so cost effective. That, uh, so uh, they may don't approve this drug to be used in Japan. But I, I, I know only a little about uh, in England, there is a different uh, proportion mm -hmm. when they consider about the cost effectiveness uh, of the drugs. So I'm not sure whether it will be better to uh, intro to approve the new drug to use in England it will be quicker and there will be uh, more op options. I, I mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think there's a few points in there. There's a, there's a, there's a category of, of, of drugs or treatments that sometimes known as orphan drugs or orphan treatments, and so indeed have sometimes have things called ultra-orphan, where the number of patients is really very small. <clears throat> and health economics is not saying um, you must always be guided just by the cost per quality, and there aren't other factors to take into account. Uh, so, for example, NICE, there's this a body here that's making these decisions. Um, the appraisal committee, which I, I've been a member of for coming up for f 14 years now, um, the appraisal committee does look at the, closely at the evidence for cost effectiveness, but it's not a, a mechanistic decision. You know, if the number is this, we say yes. If it's that, we say no. There's other factors to take into account. And so, for example, uh, 
you might want to take into account the, the rarity of a condition because there will be a tendency for some of these treatments for a particularly rare condition, a tendency for it to be even more expensive. Uh, partly because some of the costs of drug development are largely fixed and then these costs are being borne by a smaller market because of fewer patients. And you may well feel that um, it's somehow unfortunate or unfair to not recognise that and you might want to do something about it. And indeed, in the United States, and in England and the rest of Europe, I, I don't know about Japan, um, often treatments are given a sort of more favourable um, treatment in terms of um, um, allowable for tax, reducing the tax burden on the manufacturer. That if the development cost is going into orphan treatments, they're treated a bit more favourably than our research and development costs incurred for other treatments. So there's some recognition that if we don't provide some additional encouragement or incentive, that there won't be enough investment in these um, treatments for smaller patient groups. So that does happen. Uh, a body like the Nice Appraisal Committee can, if it so wishes, decide that it wants to treat something one area more favorably than another. I'll give you an example. There's a drug called Pemetrexed, Pemetrexed, which is partly a treatment for lung cancer, but also a treatment for mesothelioma. Now, mesothelioma is um, a disease f which is brought about by exposure to asbestos. And many um, people back in time, at least in England, back in time, worked in industries that used quite a lot of asbestos. There wasn't a great awareness of the potential dangers. And so many, many people working in these industries got exposed to asbestos and subsequently have had major health problems, one of them being mesothelioma. So when NICE was looking at Pemetrexed, for mesothelioma. We looked at how well the drug works. I must say the evidence is not great, but it does some positive evidence. We looked at the cost, and if I recall, the cost per quality was coming out at about 38,000 or something like that. Now back then, that was a time when we were tending to accept things maybe around about 25,000, or we're beginning to go up to 30,000 pounds. 38,000 would have been, would have appeared too high. Why spend 38,000 here to get a quali if we can spend less money somewhere else to get a quali and get more health? And we still approved it. We said yes. And the driver there was this feeling that it was, it was relevant consideration. One, mesothelioma is a very unpleasant disease. Two, there are, well, Pemetrex said then, and probably still is, about the only treatment that shows effect. And three, these people, this patient group, largely had the condition, not through any fault of their own, but through their occupation. And those circumstances taken together led the committee to say yes. And so you could do the same thing with um, some um, drugs that are for, to treat exceptionally rare conditions. So there's, 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 no, there's no sort of rule, there's no, yeah, there's no rule present here that says if it's more than 30,000 pounds per quality or pick a number, it's no. You're weighing up different circumstances. Or put it another way, maybe not all qualities are worth the same. So I'll, I'll maybe say, I will say a little bit more about quality at some point, but there's this measure of, of health gain, the quality just in life here, and the great strength of it is potentially you can use it in lots of different areas. 
So it's, it's not a condition-specific measure. You can, it's more ge generic. But maybe not all qualities are worth the same. Some qualities are more valuable than others. And in effect, a decision that says yes to pemetrexed for mesothelioma is saying that quality gain we get in that patient group we value a bit more highly, uh, partly because it's such an unpleasant condition and partly because it was brought on by uh, exposure which they had no, the patients had no choice in. I don't know if that addresses your yeah, question. Thank you. Thank you. I think the takeaway point there is if it was sort of mechanistic, if it was simply we do the sums and the numbers above a line or below a line and you've got a decision, well, all you need is a sort of, I would say a big computer, probably not even a very big computer. You just need people checking the numbers, feeding the information in, out comes the answer. That's not how the decision making is done. Uh, how it's done is a committee taking quite a lot of time to review the evidence, evidence partly produced by the manufacturer, um, evidence, uh, a lot of it clinical evidence, um, looking at that very carefully and deciding on balance does this look a good use of resources for the NHS in England or not. So it's not mechanistic. But, having said that, the cost per quality remains a very important input because that is signalling to you how well this treatment performs compared to other ways you could spend the money elsewhere in the health service. Okay. Yes. You just said that not all quality values the same. Uh, who judges it? Who uh, assesses it? Right. Which, which quality values more? Right. In this context, it's a particular committee that is, is making that judgment. Um, it's made up of uh, a range of individuals, many of them from a clinical background, some from the health services more on management side, some of it more, um, I tend to say technical, but technical set evaluation sense, statistician, health economist, uh, a range of, of skills and background, and some lay individuals, lay persons. So, it's a broad range of individuals. So it's quite complicated. <laughs> the individual decisions are quite complicated, but the the process, <coughs> excuse me, the process. Well, I suppose the process could seem complicated. I mean, I, I've been doing it so long that it doesn't seem complicated. But it's there's a very detailed process by which. Um, manufacturers engage and produce information. That information is dealt with on a particular time scale. Uh, there's a, something called a reference case. There's a sort of standard approach that they're expected to follow, but they can also bring in additional information. So that, in that sense, that's sort of complex. But the real complexity comes when on an individual decision, trying to weigh up these factors which may go beyond just the cost and the quality. And of course, these costs and these qualities are uncertain. And that's not a product of the economics, that's a product often of the medicine and the clinical trial information that's available. What might seem a simple question like, if we use this drug, how much of it will we use per patient on average? We don't know uh, because there's a distribution in time to treatment discontinuation. We can see that in the trial, but we fully know that if you then take that and do it in routine practice, you might get quite a different pattern of time to treatment discontinuation. You might get a different estimate of how much drug is used. So there's lots of uncertainties. And so I guess it is complex in, in one sense. Uh, you've got to interpret a range of evidence which is quite sometimes sophisticated evidence. Trials themselves can sometimes be hard to interpret. The economic model 
can be quite complicated sometimes. And then you've got the other sort of factors that you might want to take into account. Uh, we are encouraged in um, these committees, this is a directive from government, to bear in mind how innovative the treatment is. And specifically, are there benefits of this treatment, because it's innovative, that are not captured in the cost per quali? Now that can be quite a, a tricky one. Um, as I said, well, for example, sometimes you're comparing taking a tablet with a subcutaneous injection. Sometimes you're comparing um, a daily treatment with once every four weeks. Now, we can see how perhaps a tablet might, for most people, be preferred to subcutaneous injection. Similarly, a subcutaneous injection is probably preferred to an infusion. We can see how treatment once a month might be better than daily treatment. Uh, but how do you, what value should you put on that? So it's, it, is, it is complex, yeah. Well, I guess <clears throat> I think what I'm saying is that the cost effectiveness information is a central part of the decision making, but it's not by itself what leads to the decision. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's how I would summarize it. Okay. Okay. I'm sure there will be continuing opportunities to, to, to ask questions.